Welcome to the National Park Service's World War II Valor in the Pacific National Monuments third attempt at broadcasting from the deck of the USS Arizona here in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Today is the 17th of October, 2015, which represents the 99th year since the commissioning of the Arizona. Next year, it'll mark the 100th anniversary of the ship and share the 100th centennial celebration with the National Park Service. Today we're going to take you on a tour of the vessel as it sits today, hopefully to answer some of the questions that you might have of what you can see on the ship, as well as bring to life what it must have been like to live, work, and uh, fight on the ship. As in past efforts, you can see the visibility is uh, fairly limited today. Bear with us. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to still see some cool things along the way. The first stop where we're headed to is the officer's, uh, flag officer's uh, stateroom. This is a porthole that you can see into from the side of the ship. If all goes according to plan here, we will have a nice view for you of the insides, you should be able to see a desk, a basin, and a telephone that is much like what it was on December 7th. We're the furthest point away from the blast area of the ship, and so this part of the vessel didn't receive uh, too much destruction force from the as you can see, it's literally the way they left it. Also notice the sediment uh, on the floor. That's the accumulation through the portholes of 74 years of Pearl Harbor settling out inside the officer's stateroom. It also talks to how little flushing happens on the, on the vessel. We're now swimming up onto the quarter deck area. This is the flat part at the stern of the vessel. Right now, you can see that there's a lot of sponges and sediment and whatnot strewn across the um, across the decking here. Hopefully, we'll be able to find a piece of teak deck that was that has been protected by this mud. And uh, today is periodically opened up by fish and currents and whatnot. Before we find that, as we're uh, coming up to this structure here, which is a big base to the ship's catapult, uh, which launched the USS Arizona's float planes into the air off the back. This was known by the ship's crew as a unseemly contraption of run very smoothly by a group of sailors uh, in and around 1940. We have some great correspondence from people who worked in this area. 
the uh, float planes were part of the ship's contingent that went out and helped uh, sight where the uh, projectiles were landing when they were firing to improve accuracy as it could be up to 17 miles away from the ship. So now as we're swimming forward, again, um, we're heading towards some hatches and turret four. Uh, here's, here's some uh, decking here. This decking is uh, very smooth. It's soft. It's an antique hardwood, a uh, endangered or threatened actually uh, wood today because of its popularity. It's still soft and warm almost in the water. You can imagine this area as a place where sailors and marines lived and worked on the deck when uh, they weren't underway. In 1941, uh, I believe, 40, a hula troop, uh, a hula dancer stopped in from Hawaii and uh, performed in this area and actually got Admiral Kidd, Vice uh, Admiral Kidd, and uh, Captain Matt Meltenberg to dance the hula in front of the in front of the uh, sailors. This is a stairwell down into opposite country. You can see the hatch is open somewhere. Guess that direction. Stainless steel stairs going down. It's all been silted up uh, from Pearl Harbor and the fact that it's been sealed uh, by the Navy uh, during uh, salvage operations. This is where officers and crew would have come up onto the quarter deck and uh, gone about their daily business. One quick note, as we go along you may see some very white coral that was our, we have a nice population of coral, however, it's uh, in the middle of a bleaching event right now. So they're very snow white and ethereal looking. If everything goes smoothly and nature runs its course, the uh, symbiotic uh, bacteria that live with coral will repopulate the coral and it will continue to live. Although obviously it's not as healthy as one would want. Now we're on orbit number four. This is where we inter survivors, Arizona survivors who are uh, interested in being reunited with their shipmates, they have a legal uh, response or a legal uh, right to be part of their uh, ship's crew. And every year, or whenever uh, uh, time necessitates it, we uh, inter them with a multi-agency dive. That takes the urn down into the depths of uh, turret number four here and places it in a little crack. You can see a great uh, explanation of this process on YouTube on our social media website. Scott, we have a question from the audience. It is. They'd like to know how many internments you've done and uh, who qualifies to be interned. So, to date, we, the Park Service and Navy have recorded 38 
uh, just about midships. It's about uh, 15 feet away from a uh, hatch that uh, is known as the oil hatch that has been leaking oil since um, we started measuring it a number of years ago. And yet you can see there's quite a bit of coral around here. And uh, it's continuing to grow, working with a number of partners and scientists from the University of Hawaii, National Park Service, Autodesk, and um, other uh, companies. Uh, we've been working on measuring this photo uh, graphically so we can quantify the growth and understand how healthy or, or distressed it may be to help us make decisions about managing the vessel into the future. Now we're swimming towards the um, port side underpass of Yeah, 
aircraft uh, got mounted uh, in uh, four pair, two pairs of four total barrels, but never actually fit into the ship. We're also on the edge of the blast zone as we come into the uh, galley area. And you can see here that uh, that this is a uh, very uh, uh, twisted area, a complicated area that has been uh, well subject to uh, explosion as well as um, uh, as well as um, uh, salvage. What I'm doing here now. off a little bit of the ship's um, sediment from the ship's flooring here. And this is the tile that the galley would have been part of. And as you can uh, imagine, you know, people used to walk and collect their cereal in the morning and bake bread and whatnot. Um, this is, we're just forward of the uh, memorial structure bow side, and you can actually see that piece of uh, oak floor tile if you look hard on a clear, visible day. And as you can also see, this structure here, which is the uh, oven bases in the in the uh, kitchen air galley area. Again, these are there's four of them. They're industrial strength to feed a contingent of up to around 1,500 men. And you can imagine the bakers and cooks using them all day and into the night. Uh, any other questions at this time? Yeah, so um, several people have seen uh, articles about the 3D project that we've done, recreating some of the artifacts from the ship, and they're wondering how we did that. Uh, the um, National Park Service has a very long history of conducting some of the most world-class science on the Arizona related to submerged cultural resources. Starting in about 2000, and, and this has been going on since about uh, early 1980s, starting in 2013, working with a whole group of partners like Autodesk, E-Track, Sam Morota, Engineering, we set out to give the ship a digital checkup, and that is to follow up on many of the um, measurements and and um, uh, existing documentation on the ship to see how it's changed over the years, as well as maintain a uh, baseline for future investigations. And one of the many technologies that we brought to bear on uh, these items uh, was photogrammetry, where we uh, took photographs of things like these uh, cereal bar, these bowls that you see cemented here into the deck, um, and we modeled them in 3D, uh, in a 3D model that uh, allows us to actually measure how big um, and how, where they are on the deck in conjunction with some other technology, uh, among other things. It also allows us to bring the sh uh, parts of the ship alive to the public. Um, we're also moving over to the pump bottle that we that we uh, modeled, and this is uh, we're quite confident is a 
model that was actually here on the vessel in 1940, where the crew could have enjoyed coke, just like we do today. Let's see if we can find it. Here, the it can sometimes be a bit of a challenge. Things change on the um, on the vessel. Here it is, right here. At least one of them. Looks like it's moved around just a little bit, which is quite interesting. I'm going to actually leave it there. But you can see, you can see the sedimentation is pretty bad here today. And there's also other pieces of the galley showing. You can see this plate. You can also see that many of these items, like the Coke bottle and this plate, have museum tags on them. These are tags that we use to track artifacts on the vessel and ensure that we know where they are and, what, and study what they're doing in the water because they do move around quite a bit. It's one of the many scientific studies that we do here with the National Park Service that uh, really um, helps us manage the vessel much better. Now we're continuing to swim towards the bow. We're right along side the funnel. Um, and we're, I think we're going to hold up here for a quick second. We've got a little bit of a snag in the line. That our divers are untangling. While you're um, dealing with that, would you um, do you want to start talking about oil, or is that something that you're going to get to a bit later? Um, so even today, the ship still leaks oil. Um, on December seventh, the ship was. Uh, full of uh, a full contingent of bunker C fuel, and uh, the bomb hit and exploded, of which you can see we're in this uh, detonation area, the explosion area, and it ruptured about half of the fuel cells. Uh, there's about 190, 200 uh, fuel cells in the vessel. And uh, those all leaked out. They also left a few of the uh, uh, fuel cells fractured and uh, leaking oil into the overhead compartments of the ship, where it then migrated all the way to uh, slowly up through the... Uh, Uh, oil uh, fuel cells 
from the side of ship that's sitting at about 25-30 feet of, of mud and Pearl Harbor. Much like you don't want to route around in your... in a church graveyard, you probably don't want to run around in a uh, battlefield uh, war grave like the Arizona. Now we're alongside turret number two. Here, uh, um, this turret also does not uh, have its gun barrels, 14 inch 45 caliber guns. They were salvaged and relined and uh, placed on the USS Nevada, which fired them in anger in the Western Pacific, I believe, uh, at least Okinawa and possibly Iwo Jima. I may be wrong on that, but um, pretty cool. Now we're heading down into about uh, 20 feet of water. Um, this is a uh, hatch alongside turret, uh, between turret one and turret two. Beautiful space. You can see a little uh, school of mangrove snappers swimming by. Those are relatively new residents on the uh, ship, or at least in the numbers that we're seeing them in. Can you tell us about how many other ships were sunk on December 7th and how many were salvaged? So all the uh, ships that were sunk on December 7th were refloated with the exception of the USS Utah, the USS Oklahoma, and the USS Arizona. There are memorials to these vessels in Pearl Harbor today that are part of World War II Valor and the Pacific National Monument and commemorate the loss of lives on each of those ships. Uh, there were approximately 20 uh, two vessels that were either sunk or damaged on uh, December 7th. A significant number, however, they typically were older vessels and ones that uh, were not as strategically important as the aircraft carriers, which later helped uh, change the tide of war in places like Midway in 1942 and uh, uh, the Marianas in 1944, among other places as well. So now we're right at um, Arizona, um, turret number one. These are the um, barrel articulation points. Uh, they allow the barrels to elevate 15 degrees. And you can imagine lifting up and shooting a 1,700 pound, 14 inch projectile nearly 17 miles into the distance. These barrels are probably about 12 to 15 feet in diameter and uh, nearly 44 feet long because of the visibility. They have a ethereal feel to them where they kind of move off into the distance where hopefully we'll, uh, our tether won't make it to the ends today. Back in the 1980s, when the Park Service first, the, with the, what is now the Submerged Resources Center, first started diving on the Arizona to uh, see what was here, 
it was a bit of a surprise to find these uh, turrets still here, the corporate memory of whether or not they were left in place had been forgotten. And now it's probably one of the more iconic spaces of the ship sitting here and uh, right here we're in about 22 feet of water you can see the, the end of the barrel here about the width of and then some of my shoulders here's the uh, center of the uh, of the uh, gun turret all three of them and even we're still having some beautiful growth of sponges that protect the uh, Arizona from rust and oxidation. Uh, Biofasci is um, very important to this vessel because it actually slows the growth down, or the uh, rusting, the oxidation down. Again, you can see the ethereal nature, and I, I don't have much better terminology for this. This is uh, because of the lighting and the clarity of the water and whatnot. It's very moving, uh, even for myself, and I know uh, the cameraman, Brett uh, Seymour, we've been diving on this for a number of years and uh, still just find it absolutely fascinating. Something that I like to point out as much as I can. Now we're heading towards the uh, bow again. I believe we're going to try to find a uh, ammunition storage locker that is on the edge of the folks hold here which is pretty cool although it is a little tough to see this is the forward section edge of the blast you can imagine a half a kiloton of ammunition detonating and as it blows things forward, it hits the triangle of the focal and stops because of the engineering of it. One of the parts that was decimated in this was this ammunition locker, which you see here. You can hardly tell that it's that it's a locker today. But in this vessel, you can see these 50 caliber bullets still sitting here. And in fact, I just saw a museum tag on one of them that we had lost track of for a long time, which is good to see or find again. You can see this. Uh, Another one, just like it was on December 7th. The Arizona, unlike many of the other vessels, didn't have much time to man their battle stations and general quarters and fight back. Fairly instantaneous uh, that the ship. struck by a bomb and exploded. Now we're moving into a little shallow, more shallow water up the side of the uh, foxhole and the uh, edge of the blast zone forward. This actually forced a, a significant bow section forward and cracked the hull. just the mechanical forces at play here that broke the steel. 
this tour of the uh, USS Arizona. And hopefully uh, we've been able to uh, answer some of your questions about what the ship was like as well as uh, what it was like to live on the, uh, on the vessel. We do have one other question. Okay. Uh, visitors would like to know um, if civilians are allowed to dive on the Arizona. No, uh, no one except military and government uh, divers are allowed to dive in Pearl Harbor. It's a closed working military port, and also the aspects of this being a war grave makes it impossible for us to allow. There are other national parks like Channel Island, Biscayne, Everglades, uh, that you can dive in uh, in the National Park Service, of which I highly recommend people look into those beautiful places, some of the most undisturbed areas in the world, and uh, very beautiful. And so with that, I think we're going to uh, wrap it up and call it a day.